Hi, my name is Greg Weissman. I'm the co-creator and co-producer of the Gargoyles television series. What you're about to see is the pitch we made back in 1993-1994 to sell the show uh, to Disney Upper Management to stations all across the United States. I hope you like it. Hi, I'm Greg Weissman, director of series development for Walt Disney Television Animation. We've got a new series coming your way in the fall of 1994, and we're very excited about it. We think it's something very new for Disney, and it's all about gargoyles. Ugly stone statues that squat on the roofs of old buildings. But a thousand years ago, gargoyles were real living creatures. And during the day, they slept frozen in stone. But when the sun went down, Goliath, the gargoyle master, would lead his gargoyle warriors in defense of the king's castle. And if there was no battle to be fought, he'd retreat to the library to read and learn, all the while making sure that the other gargoyles stayed out of trouble. Now, for all these efforts, Goliath received no reward, no thanks, or even kindness. In fact, the people of the castle treated all gargoyles with nothing but contempt. Still, Goliath could no more stop guarding the castle than breathing the air. It's part of a gargoyle's nature to be territorial, protective. And so, for years, he maintained his lonely vigil. Then one night, Goliath was betrayed and lured away from his post. The castle was overrun and sacked. Goliath and the surviving gargoyles were unfairly blamed, and the kingdom sorcerer laid a curse upon them that put them into a stone sleep that lasted a thousand years. New York City, 1994. A rich and powerful man has decided there's a better place for a medieval castle than a picturesque hill in Scotland. He's moved the whole deal, lock, stock, and gargoyle, to the top of the tallest skyscraper in Manhattan. All of which means absolutely nothing to New York City police detective Elisa Chavez. Uh, she doesn't care about castles and she doesn't believe in curses. She's hot on the trail of a major bad guy. A trail that leads her right into an ambush. Now, fortunately, a shadowy figure sees what's happening and decides to help. And of course, that shadowy figure is Goliath, the gargoyle. Now when you're as strong as Goliath, bench pressing two bad guys is easy. And that stone-like hide of his makes him practically invulnerable to everything but Elisa's kindness. And she's the first human being who's ever offered him understanding and friendship, hope, and a sense of purpose. She introduces him to his new home, Manhattan, and asks for his help in protecting it against modern-day barbarians. Uh, fortunately, our hero doesn't have to face those barbarians alone. Uh, this is Goliath's old friend Hudson, a veteran gargoyle warrior. Hudson helps out by keeping an eye on the young warriors in training. Brooklyn, Lexington, and Broadway. Uh, they pick their own names. And then there's Bronx, the angst-ridden gargoyle dog. Bronx is not a big fan of adventure. He just likes to eat a lot, sleep a lot, and make a general mess. Now, Goliath has wider interests, but it can be hard for a seven-foot-tall medieval monster to squeeze into the modern world, especially with Xanatos around. Rich, powerful, and arrogant, Xanatos bought the gargoyle's castle. Now he thinks he owns the gargoyles as well. If something rotten is happening in New York City, the odds are Xanatos is behind it. But Goliath's greatest foe is the evil gargoyle Demona. Once she and Goliath were friends, but a thousand years ago it was her betrayal that cost him the castle. Now she's his sworn enemy and she won't rest until she owns the night. And the night is all that matters because the gargoyles still sleep as stone statues during the day. Finding an outdoor ledge just before sunrise and striking a pose that could give you nightmares. But when the sun goes down, there are only protection against the city's dark terrors. They are the Gargoyles, joining the Disney family in 1994. It's a monster! It's not Superman, it's not Batman, it's not a, a superhero comic. Gargoyles is all about shaking people up there. You can't believe everything you see on TV. It broke the mold. As we went out to explore the world, we were also exploring different cultures. I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and I thought the scripts were brilliant. We were still finishing up the post-production on season one when uh, I was called into a meeting with Buena Vista Television and they gave us some great news. They wanted to give us a pickup for season two. They said, how many episodes can you do for season two? And I said, we did 13 the first season, so we can do 13. And they said, uh, 13, uh, how about 52? And I said, how about a nervous breakdown? 
hitting an order for 52 episodes was pretty exciting after the first season. What wasn't really exciting about it is that we had a very short time in which to do it, so it was kind of like a, a mad dash. So the theme for season two, both behind the scenes and on screen, became expansion. 52 episodes in several different studios working on the animation uh, is a little crazy. Suddenly we went from being this tiny little crew in Los Angeles sending stuff out to Japan to being this big mammoth production almost overnight. Speed is the key. Slow and steady wins the race. <clears throat> it makes it a lot easier if you can use stock background, stock characters, and all that. And that was not this show. This show was a new adventure every weekend, every sense of the word. Now, we had expanded the crew, but we also had to expand the world of the Gargoyles universe to create this tapestry of characters and events and place and time that would allow us to tell 52 stories and not run out of ideas. We did the world tour, at least, you know, uh, planned it and began it. We expanded back in time. We filled in the blanks between where our series had begun in 10th century Scotland and where it currently was in 20th century Manhattan. I think if we'd kept them in New York, there was the danger of falling into a kind of a formula. And by taking them out of that and sending them on this big trip, it opened us up to all kinds of new stories. You get it into a, an action-adventure cartoon, it's always about the action or the adventure. It's, the character seems almost secondary. This type of show, the action-adventure is a secondary part because it's all about character. In our original development for Gargoyles, we had this trio of young Gargoyles who became eventually Brooklyn, Lexington, and Broadway. Catch Lex! <laughs> Isn't this great? It just doesn't get any better than this. I think Brooklyn really came into his own in the second season. It had always been our plan that he was the next Goliath, that he would be the next leader of the clan. I think he was always up to the responsibility of, of you know, becoming a Goliath. He wanted to be the hero, but, you know, didn't exactly always know how. How long has it been like this? Your friend is impatient. The curse of youth. Jeff played just a ton of characters, and what's great about Jeff is every time the voice is distinct, you'd never know. It's a bike. Isn't that a cool bike? Yes, it is a very cool bike. Unfortunately, we're going to have to blow it up. I'm so sorry, Brooklyn. Yes, but before you blow it up, I'd like to change it into a beautiful woman. You'll forgive me if I just shake your hand. Of course. I'm quite glad the plan worked. Bill Fagerbacke's work as Broadway was just brilliant. I mean, you had to fall in love with that guy. Broadway got to do a lot of funny stuff, and I'm comfortable with that, and certainly working in a sitcom put me in a situation where I could enjoy the jokes. <laughs> so I, I, I love the humor of Broadway. I love being the goofball. That's, that's far more fun than being the serious one. And then, of course, you've just got this incredibly endearing performance from Tom Adcox, who played Lexington. When I saw the description of Lexington, I, it reminded me a lot of myself, except I know nothing about computers. <laughs> but he was hyper and energetic and excited about everything. It's too weird. Kind of fun, but weird. Everybody brought a certain special quality to their characters. You know, there's a certain part of Ed Astor that you will see in Hudson. It's going to be a bad night. The character reference referred to um, Hudson as uh, Hudson hates spunk. Uh, I never did Hudson with spunk. I did Hudson with grouchy old man is what I generally portrayed. I mean, if anybody would have told me that I would be sitting next to Ed Asner and we both are playing gargoyles, of course. I mean, I, I always loved the script. I thought the variations and the casting and the grouping, the selection of characters was always wonderful. Our second season was the opportunity to really delve deeper. We had Goliath and Hudson and Bronx, and we had a strong female character in Elisa, and we had a powerful female villain in Demona. But I felt very strongly that we were missing something, that we were missing a positive, feminine, gargoyle influence. 
Surely we were sent here for something more important than this. The character of Angela was a new character we brought in, and she went with our guys on the world tour. And she was, she was a fascinating character to work for because she was utterly naive. She was a gargoyle that had never been out to see the world, so we got to look at the world through fresh eyes every time we worked with her. And the actor who played her, Bridget Bacco, was marvelous. I have to go see the world, find my place in it. What I thought was really interesting about Angela, she was very strong, even though she was very young. She was very young and there was still a naivety to her and it's certainly about this gargoyle world that she was entering into with her father. But I thought there was a great sadness about her that she always had to fight. Angela was a very classic character to me. I sort of positioned her after Juliet and Desdemona and many, many great Shakespeare characters. So I felt I got to do the classics when I went to work to do gargoyles. If the humans knew how valiant gargoyles are, would they not open their hearts? Gargoyles was so Shakespearean in nature that it just seemed a natural to begin including um, Shakespeare characters. We started with Macbeth in the first season, but it's the second season where I really started to get out of control with it. I thought everybody knew this. Yeah, that guy Shakespeare wrote a play about them, A Midsummer Night's Dream. It made the show really different from any show that was out there. I think the thing that caught me about this show and intrigued me was its intelligence. It was a really intellectual show. It was a really historical show. I mean, it made you think. And I thought it was so great that kids were getting and like obsessed with this show because they were learning so much while they watched it. One of our hopes, sincere hopes, was that kids would watch the show and go, I want to know more about Midsummer Night's Dream. I'm going to go get that play and read it. And in fact, the fans have told me that that happened. It's one of the things I'm proudest of. Don't gush all over us, OK? It's kind of embarrassing. I've been in 30 movies and five TV shows, and I get more fan mail from Gargoyles than anything I have ever done. The fans were, and are, remarkable. I mean, their, um, their loyalty to the show is, uh, is great. Uh, I think it's pretty phenomenal that they'll take the time, you know, and the effort to do the things that they have in keeping gargoyles alive after all these years. They've maintained my passion for the show, and I think they're, you know, a big part of the reason that this DVD is existing at all. A lot of times when you write animation, <clears throat> you're not going to get real deep into it because it's usually just one character whacking the other on the head or something like that. And we really got into some dark stuff, some interesting stuff from the bottoms of our psyches for it. It always went beyond, you know, some kind of weird gothic pro wrestling thing. It went beyond that into these, these wonderful relationships that these characters had. My greatest complaint about the show was that they didn't write Hudson in enough. I felt like it was like a theater ensemble group of characters. It makes me proud to have been a part of it. It's about optimism. You have these characters which have very little to be optimistic about, and yet at the end of the day, when everything has been thrown their way, they're still standing and they're still optimistic that there's going to be a better tomorrow. The show first aired in 1994, and uh, it was kind of my baby. We created a small group of gargoyles who would have a spell cast on them, fall asleep for a thousand years, and wake up in modern Manhattan. And we picked Manhattan because any city in the world, Manhattan is the one that most screams now. I kind of did hope that this would be something that would have something of an afterlife, but what wound up happening way exceeded our expectations. Welcome to the eighth annual Gathering of the Gargoyles. 
fans come to the gathering of the Gargoyles Lounge. We're on our eighth annual convention. We've had fans from Korea, from Australia, Israel, Germany, Belgium, uh, from Ireland. Brilliant. It was just brilliant. This is a show that is going to make you think. It was like a crash course in Shakespeare, history, mythology. They were real individuals. They had motivations, they had goals. Adults could watch it, get something out of it. Kids could watch something and get something completely different. Gargoyles rule. Gargoyles was my childhood. And so, so much of it, its richness is just, is kind of always with me. The quest itself is the essence of myth. It's the essence of fairy tale. Uh, seeking, when, when you're seeking other people, you're also seeking yourself. It's like being at a family reunion. People that would not ordinarily meet came together and continue to come together year after year. I made a lot of friends through the show. I've picked up, started reading classic literature and Shakespeare and ancient mythologies. It brought us together. It gave us, it, it brought us to start looking at our lives together based upon something that we both enjoyed. They're interested in what happened between episodes. A lot of fan fiction is written based on, you know, what happened between this scene and that scene. What we're going to do tomorrow is I'm going to give you a character name and some other very minor information about him, and we're going to flesh out the character from the opposite direction. The show has had a tremendous effect on my life. I've been a writer for many years, and I began writing fan fiction. It gave me an opportunity to get feedback from other readers, other fans of the show, and that gave me the, the confidence to try things in my own original writing that I might not otherwise have done. You're awake. You're alive. We're together again. I always liked the family aspect of it, and that's really what carried me into the fandom. You had people that were thrown out of time and place, and they were willing to create their own bonds of family and of connectedness. It's the last scene before the Thalog, right after the Thalog fight. Right. I was really outcast in high school and made fun of all the time and went home crying after school every day. And uh, basically the, the Gargoyles fandom became my family. And they, you know, were the people that I came home after school every day and chatted with. And it's because I could look forward to seeing them online every day that I made it through high school because I had no one else. Come right away. My family. <laughs> In a way, Gargoyles is about the process of becoming human. I think a very human quest is finding your place in the world and learning how to be accepted and ac accepting of others. There's an attraction for people who feel outcast. These Gargoyles characters are kind of, you know, isolated and they can't come out in the open because people will fear them or, or hurt them, but they want to do what's right. They want to protect people and help people which there's a lot of people out there that feel outcast from society, but they really want to do the right thing for people. And that's, you know, the show kind of hits this nerve that no other show has ever hit before. You get to celebrate the content of someone's character as opposed to by, by the color of their skin or their outward appearance. I mean, that was to me, that, that to me is the most impressive element about, about Gargoyles, because it, 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 it forces you to deal with who they are, not what they look like, or anything, else, anything external. You are dealing with, you know, internal principles about these people. I see no walls to guard this city. Well, our biggest worries aren't from outside. They're from inside. That I am all too familiar with. You have a show that teaches you something. You have a show that entertains you. You have a show that talks about social issues. What better thing do you want in programming? You know, Goliath, you may be the best thing to happen to this city in a long time. I have many favorite characters, and if I had to pick one, I would say Goliath, because he is such a deep and complicated character with so much tragedy and so much intensity and passion. We will save the humans, and we will have our revenge. We had a very clear picture of who Goliath was, a sort of tragic and yet optimistic figure. And Keith David obviously would eventually totally bring Goliath to life with his amazing voice. They were at first going to put some sound enhancement or, you know, put some reverb and stuff on it, but they didn't have to. There is something you can do for me, Magus.
cast your spell one more time. I, I was very moved by Goliath. I was moved by playing him. They are not displaced citizens, but they were citizens from another time, another place that were placed in this modern context and maintained that integrity. <laughs> What initially got me was the art style and the, the sort of dark gothic style. It was more of a dark story. Gargoyles are asleep all day long. So their world is the world at night, Manhattan at night, from Goliath's point of view. And Goliath is basically an optimist. And that means it's not a, a world of black and gray. It's a gorgeous world of deep purples and rich blues and magentas and reds. and and just this terrific color palette. Stone streets, finer than those the Romans built. I was completely blown away. I'd watched a lot of animated series, but none have ever blown me away like, actually none have blown me away before. That one did, Gargoyles did. A huge amount of, of artists were inspired by the show. Again, a few of them have become professional artists. I drew a lot of Gargoyles pictures and eventually got into the animation industry. I would have to thank Gargoyles for pushing me in that direction. It's tremendously gratifying. They've invested themselves as much in the show as we, the creators, did back when we were making it. Every year at the Gathering of the Gargoyles, they have an art show room, and it's just amazing the art that we see going through there. Based right off of the show, they have original fan fiction characters, that is, characters they came up with, but set in the world of the show. I always liked Elisa. She wasn't afraid to take on everything that was thrown at her. Mr. Burnett, I heard automatic weapons firing up there. Now you can let me look the place over, or I can come back with a warrant and a lot more cops. It's your call. We were very determined that Elisa would not be a damsel in distress, that she would not be Lois Lane to Goliath Superman. And I'm not knocking Superman and Lois Lane, because I love those characters, but we wanted a different dynamic. You're a private citizen, Xanatos, not a country. She was just such a strong role model, and of course, she also had the gentleness and the kindness to win Goliath's heart. Come on, let's get out of here before something else happens. I particularly enjoyed the romance between Elisa and Goliath. I think it was something that was beautifully developed over the course of many, many episodes and really kept the audience hooked and watching to see what would happen next. The more I watched, the more I loved it. There was more there to like. I'd like to welcome you all to the seventh annual uh, gathering radio play. What got me hooked to these gatherings was the radio play, which is an event where Greg Wiseman brings a script to the gathering and casts fans and original voice actors in the parts, and we perform it in front of the convention. Sorry, it's the best I can do. The injury will heal when they turn to stone. We have other worries. Goliath cloaks his wings delicately. The copter flies overhead, shining its spotlight on the roof. Thanks to the gathering radio plays, I've developed an interest in voice acting for animation, and so that's something I'm pursuing. show was a little bit dangerous, a little bit unpredictable. Guys who seem to be good guys. I mean, David Zantos is this handsome, sort of Bruce Wayne-esque figure that you think might be their best buddy, and he turns out to be the bad guy. And then he turns out to be even more complicated than that. It's not as simple as saying he's evil. Magnificent. Make the offer now, Owen, this instant. It may prove difficult to find the necessary manpower. You know the answer to that, Owen. And we got to that scene where Xanatos says, pay a man enough and he'll, he'll walk, walk barefoot, barefoot into hell. hell. And I was like, oh, dang, you know? <laughs> Can you say that in a Disney cartoon? It's like, and so like from that point, I, I knew this was something cool and different, and I was just hooked. I was really young. I was like, oh my, like, did he say what I think he said? <gasps> Goliath, my love. Demona is this tremendously complex, character full of guilt having lived
for a thousand years. The, our gargoyles, our heroes, were asleep for a thousand years, but Demona wasn't. She was alive for a thousand years. And uh, Demona, in essence, becomes her own worst enemy. The centuries have made you weak, Goliath. She's not your typical villain. I mean, she has a legitimate gripe, she, a legitimate cause. I mean, don't see these villains outside of classic literature. Demona. Demona. And we literally have biologists in the fandom who have tried to figure out the evolutionary origins of gargoyles based on evidence of the series and tidbits of information that I've thrown out. When you see the bright burst of light from a gargoyle's eyes, and then the glow goes down when they actually move. So if they're blinded for that brief second, it doesn't really matter because they're hoping that whatever they're growling at is too scared to move anyway. They're attacking the castle. That's all we need to know. Yeah. Finally, I, I don't think there's any question who best in show was this year. Congratulations. These are creative people. They're artists, they're writers, actors. I mean, it, it runs the gamut. This one took me about nine months. It was one of my first ones. Uh, this is rubber, okay? A lot of it is cloth, like lycra and whatnot. The wings are aluminum, you know, for lightness and, and, and so forth. Like all great uh, cartoons, uh, great stories, it's for kids and adults. Everybody can get something out of it. And we were blown away. It's a show for everybody. It's a clever show. It is not just throwaway cartoon entertainment. It's full of dozens of, upon dozens of really amusing lines. Every time I mention the show, people always perk up and go, oh, God, I love that show. They were like real people, and uh, the audience responded. It continues to stand the test of time and it continues to be interesting and intellectually engaging. I've been in this business for 25 years and it was some of the best fun I've ever had in life. I think we've created something and the fans have sustained what we created so that it can go on indefinitely. The truth is if it comes to an end tomorrow, I'll be grateful for what we had. And if it goes on long after I'm gone, then that's pretty cool too.